everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today in this amazing opportunity to share uh, with some amazing leaders in different areas. So we'd like to uh, talk a little bit about Let's Talk Interactive. We're a 20-year-old telehealth company. Uh, we have built enterprise uh, telehealth software from patient acquisition to care to aftercare and remote patient monitoring, as well as uh, virtual hospitals, so our at-home hospital care. Uh, we were inspired to do this because my mother uh, ran a, a national not-for-profit about 28 years ago, and it was really uh, for children that have been abused. So saw this massive gap in mental health services, which still exists today, but uh, eliminating geographical boundaries was was a way to dis, uh, redistribute um, these professionals to provide this care. And uh, today, we're looking at virtual care as really a part of our lives post-COVID. Uh, we've adopted uh, this technology, which is really creating access to care to more people. And the more access to care that we can create, uh, the better uh, the better healthcare system I believe we'll have. Um, I'd like to introduce some of the people that we have with us today. And so, um, as you know, we have amazing experts and our former acting uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services in 2017 and Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services from 2018 to 21, the Honorable Eric D. Hargan. We also have former Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Abuse Use and head of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration from 2017 to 21, Dr. Eleanor McCants Katz. We have Elliot Weiss, who is a, a director in health and policy government uh, relationships or relations with the Fagri, I hope I said that right, Fagi uh, drinking or sorry, Fagi Dinker and um, Valued Policy Advisor for the American Telemedicine Association, which is a national association working to advocate and adopt telehealth and or telemedicine association, sorry, um, telehealth in all aspects of medical care. And finally, an internationally known advocate uh, for healthcare, mental health care for life, uh, Kathy Ireland, uh, this is this group that we have today. So thank you so much for joining. And I'd like to start off with um, the Honorable Eric Hart. So Eric, thank you again so much for taking this time today. And um, I will turn it to you. Great. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Art. Um, I would like to um, just here at the beginning kind of set the table for sort of how these problems have persisted and how the pandemic kind of put a, a real point on the issue that was already existing, frankly, as you point out, Art, it was an already existing problem, but that has really been accentuated by the pandemic. Um, now, at the beginning and the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I, I was there at HHS at that time, uh, and we knew very early in the pandemic uh, that the restrictions, the lockdowns that were taken to mitigate the spread of the disease, its morbidity and mortality, really at the time was an unknown viral agent. It was going to take a toll on the mental health of Americans. Uh, that was highlighted for us, uh, not least by Dr. McCants Katz that you're gonna hear from later. And, and of course, this toll has been taken broadly across the entire country, indeed the world, but the group that has suffered in many ways the most are children. Uh, so the fallout has really hit them hardest in many ways. Now, prior to the pandemic, as I mentioned, uh, there we knew there were already major gaps uh, in mental health and in substance abuse resources for children. Uh, up to 22% of school-aged children had been diagnosed with a mental health condition prior to COVID-19, um, and up to 80% of them had unmet mental health needs. So that was already kind of a pre-existing issue before the pandemic hit. Now, we had already been working, uh, having recognized this, we'd already been working hard to put in place new resources uh, to make it possible for adolescents, just like adults, to get mental health care. Now, prior to the pandemic, you know, these, these plans were already kind of in train, 
But when you look at what happened in the pandemic, there were some very, uh, and I think in many ways, very good responses that we were able to get out there in the middle of the pandemic that might have long lasting good effects on our ability to deal with mental health and substance use issues for uh, for children and adolescents. So one of the main things was telehealth technologies. Um, now, prior to the pandemic, there was very little use of telehealth uh, interventions in behavioral health outside of LTI, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, there were there were there was that much access to it outside of this, and it was very limited in many ways, uh, especially on the re the reimbursement of it and the spread of it. Particularly, it was constrained both technologically uh, and in terms of the ability to pay for it. Now, we worked uh, early on in the pandemic. You saw it in March of 2020. So you're saying two months or less after we even learned about the virus, we put in place new rules that allowed people to use things like Zoom uh, and other platforms to be able to access medical care and get reimbursed for it. So Medicare and Medicaid could pay for it. Uh, and the commercial payers followed suit as they often do. That that just really, in medical care generally, it was a huge uplift uh, in the use of telehealth technologies, really by a factor of a thousand percent, hundreds of times, hundred X from the first week of March to the first week of April in terms of what we had seen. So it was an explosion of use of telehealth across a broad variety of medical areas but one of the most significant was mental health and substance use. Uh, it, it may be a point of interest. We actually prepared for this because we were preparing a big uh, rural health rollout later on in 2020 prior to the pandemic. And so we were already planning from a policy point of view to look at telehealth and sort of increase its access. Uh, but obviously in the middle of the pandemic, we were able to move on that very quickly. Three different agencies that had to do different regulations, which is uh, not a small feat inside the government <laughs> uh, to be able to get three different agencies to cooperate at the same time on a particular area, but it did happen. Now, implementing telehealth, it's, it is not like flipping a switch. Uh, it's We had to move pretty quickly, but to get it there, you have to fund things like training providers to be able to use it, be able to assure privacy so that people can have uh, some level of security and comfort in accessing it to make sure it's compliant with people's understanding about what they're going to, how they're going to be compliant with HIPAA and addressing billing issues so that that would be more sustainable over the long term financially for the providers who are providing access to these services. Now, uh, there were, because as we all know, we remember it very well, there's very limited ability to do face to face visits. Uh, most non emergency care, uh, however construed, was constrained uh, in there. So people weren't getting regular access to healthcare. Now, and telehealth is and will continue to be important in areas that it always was, like rural areas, like where I grew up. Uh, and one thing that I think is going to be important to think about as we go forward uh, is the fact that it seems to be, we saw a huge uptick and then it went down, but it never returned. The use of it never returned to the low level it had been in before. It has become, I believe, a permanent part of American medicine. It's just, it is now uh, at a much higher level and much greater expectations on the part of both providers, healthcare providers like doctors, as well as patients, that there's gonna be far more access uh, to telehealth and telemedicine uh, in the future. Now, what does that mean? Um, you know, we're gonna have to work, frankly, to make it permanent. Those changes that were made in the pandemic were temporary in many cases. So everybody who's interested in this area is gonna to have to maintain focus as we exit the emergency, as we exit the pandemic, and I mean, not just from a real world point of view, but also from a legal and reimbursement point of view, from a bureaucratic point of view, we're gonna exit it. At some point, those rules have to be in place to enable the good parts of the response, like telehealth and telemedicine to continue on and continue helping the way that they have been. Now, one thing that we had to realize obviously was that school is the focal point of life for many, most children uh, and to a significant, uh, extent their families as well. So not just the children going to school, but those of us with school age children, me, uh, school is definitely a focal point of the families. Uh, so we assisted schools in developing sort of their on-site based mental health services to be covered by Medicaid funding. 
Uh, so there was an ability to kind of do that, that they could have face-to-face -face visits in school and utilize telehealth services delivered in their school settings as well. So that is uh, the ability to kind of assist that, facilitate that is going to be important. And, and as we move forward and as we transition, God willing, on the permanent downside from this pandemic, we really need to make sure that particularly the children, adolescents, young people generally, that we've laid the groundwork and the capacity to be able to address their needs in the broadest way possible. And that means we have to be able to provide these resources, not just in person, but also remotely uh, using the technologies that have expanded so dramatically over the last couple of years. Um, uh, and with that sort of table setting, um, I'll turn it back to you, Art. Oh, thank you, Eric. And I have one quick question on that. Um, sure. Outside of I know all the work that's going on uh, in the background to really update some of these policies that were temporary to make them permanent, because they do make sense. And we are running some data from some of the groups that went from zero use of telehealth to 100% of telehealth. Yep. Yep. Then COVID, it fell back to where 20% of the people went back to the urgent cares, but 80% held on to the telehealth. And this was primarily in some of the Native American tribes, um, Nebraska, for example. Yep. Have you seen similar? Because when it looks at our graph, it goes up and then it just peaks down and goes level. So yeah. it's it, it's it's wound its way into everything. And I mean, some of the surprising areas that frankly never expected things like teledentistry uh, to appear, right? It's It permeated into every area. Um, podiatry, dentistry, like everywhere. I mean, obviously you're not gonna be doing surgery remotely yet, but the point is, is that so much, I think people were very creative when they had to be to understand how to put it into everything. And it has never come down to where it was before. Um, and so it has become, as I said, I think it's a permanent part and it's at, at a much higher level than it ever was before. It was a, it was an unusual, peculiar corner of medicine in the past, except for areas very remote like Alaska, where it had been an accepted part of medical practice for decades. Um, it, it, outside of that and very unusual circumstances and very remote and rural areas, it really wasn't part of anybody's daily life to deal with. And it wasn't thought to be. So, um, but, I, but I, as I said, I said, I think you're right. I think, it is I think your, your experience of that is the same. Uh, that it's it is it has leveled off from that really tremendous peak because so much of medicine has to be in person. It has to be person to person. Has to be in person touch, <laughs> using touch, using uh, things and the people uh, to deliver the services. So it's got a, it, a lot of it moved back into physical uh, one on one or however many encounters. But it's not a lot of it is now being able to be done. And I, I mean it was a very creative response uh, in unusual circumstances, but I think it taught everybody that there's a lot more we can do in this area, and uh, and and it has increased access uh, to a lot of things that I think people didn't think could be done this way before, and allowed people to get care uh, that they could not get before in any practical way. You could always tell people, yeah, you can come into the clinic, you can come into the hospital, but they just weren't doing it from a practical point of view. And if you can change the dynamic there, it's gonna be better for everybody. And Eric, I'm sorry, one more question, because uh, you got my mind thinking, but how important are wearables and other things to help doctors not have that physical touch for pulse ox, blood pressure, EKG? That's been, there's been a lot of uh, interesting programs that have been run in that area. Again, Alaska has been doing this for a while. So I'll, I'll leave one of our states off to one side because they've been doing this for a while. But yeah, all those, all of those devices that go around that can do monitoring and the things that are going to be downstream from wider use of them on a lot of areas dealing with even chronic disease that, uh, that can help alleviate problems, digital scales, pulse ox, uh, remote blood pressure monitoring, lots of information that can be brought into the hands of the clinicians to be able for them to be able to diagnose and keep aware of what's going on with their patients to get, be kept better track of it. And frankly, artificial intelligence and algorithms that help monitor those things over 24-7 uh, periods of time that are going to allow the, the diagnosis of patterns and things that can hopefully 
get to people, give people information that they need earlier, uh, instead of everything being kind of, oh no, uh, here's an emergency, time to go to the hospital. Uh, so I think that's that's a very encouraging area. And you know, we've got a lot of smart people in the tech sector who are working very avidly to help build out uh, those kinds of those kinds of systems and devices uh, to even enrich what we've been able to do in the last two years. So it sounds to me like uh, telehealth is the ability for proactive health versus reactive health. Yes. Yeah. Get ahead of it. That's great. Well, Eric, thank you so much for the time and um, for the amazing work you do for everyone else and your brilliance in helping this this tsunami we've talked about in the past stay in. Like, not all tsunamis need to retract, and this is one. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, with that, I would like to um, bring in Dr. McCants Katz, who will be sharing more of the on addressing um, the importance and needs in young Americans. And I think Eric spoke a lot about that. I know my company spends a lot of time with uh, schools and, and children too. So Dr. McCants Katz, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes to give a picture of where we were in the lead up to the pandemic, actions that were taken during the first year of the pandemic in 2020 to address mental health and where we are now. Supporting children's mental health was a major priority pre-pandemic because we knew the need was great. The National Survey on Drug Use and Health told us that in 2019, there were significant increases in major depression in adolescents. Depression can cause serious impairment. Young people not able to be successful in school, not able to fully participate in social activities, and it can increase risk for suicidal thinking and even plans and attempts. Adolescents with major depression also have much higher rates of drug and alcohol use compared to peers without depression, which underscores the significant dangers faced by these youth. With the pandemic came school closures, isolation, boredom, anxiety, stress, and a lack of supports. At the same time as the healthcare system closed to virtually all services except COVID-related care and medical emergencies. For some, it became easier to get drugs and alcohol than to get health care, and the pandemic saw increases in mental disorders and overdose deaths. The urgency of the mental health crisis facing our youth is reflected in recent data. CDC recently reported a 31% increase in emergency department visits for mental health crises and a significant increase in suicide attempts in adolescents during the pandemic in 2020 with a nearly 51% increase and suicide attempts in girls relative to 2019 data. CDC also confirmed the poor mental health of adolescents during the pandemic, reporting that 37% of adolescents experienced poor mental health during the first half of 2021. CDC also reported an overall 10% increase in suicide deaths in those aged 10 to 19 during the pandemic compared to data from the years 2015 through 2019. Added to this was the tragic 94% increase in drug overdose deaths in 14 to 18 year olds driven by fentanyl exposure. In March of 2020, we quickly moved to shore up the mental health system in anticipation of the effects of the COVID restrictions. In thinking about mental health issues facing our young people then and now, some of the key factors to address include treatment access, social supports, communication, family involvement, and school resources. Telehealth was a critically important move forward in behavioral health care during the pandemic. Telehealth provides a means by which people can access care without having to go in person to a provider's office or to a treatment program. And by adding the flexibility of online visits with a healthcare provider, telehealth reduces stigma and makes it easier for patients to get their mental health needs met. Mental health clinics are now being developed in many schools and telehealth can be an important resource in these programs. To help facilitate development of these clinics, CMS and SAMHSA developed a guidance in 2019 that gives information on how schools can plan for mental health services that can be Medicaid reimbursable and address the needs of their students. Agreements with behavioral health providers can be put in place that can form the basis of services children and their families that will be sustainable. Other resources 
including the SAMHSA technology transfer centers, which were greatly expanded in the two years prior to the pandemic, assisted with the major effort put in place to train behavioral health providers on telehealth services delivery in 2020. Mental health first aid and similar programs that train students and parents, teachers and school officials on how to recognize and assist someone who is having a mental health crisis is important to early intervention, encouraging us to look out for each other when help is needed. Another important resource is the new 988 number for seeking help in a mental health crisis. There are no cost online resources such as findtreatment.gov, which can help to locate behavioral health providers. And finally, the rebuilding of the public mental health system continues. Known as the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic Program, mental health, substance abuse, and physical health treatment services are offered in one integrated setting for both children and adults. 24-7 crisis intervention services are an important component of this program as well. These resources help to keep people out of emergency departments and in the mental health system that can better meet their needs. So there are a number of resources that now exist and will grow with time in helping to address the mental health crisis, which is so severely affecting our children. These resources can be life-saving, but to be so, people need to be aware of them and aware of how to access services. We've made a list of resources available that can help to provide information people can use to help to find the supports they need. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Art. Well, thank you, Dr. McCants Katz. I have a quick question. We actually had a question that came in and it was calling out school nurses. And this is from Kelly Johnson. So school nurses are using telehealth very effectively. I hope the speakers can recognize this goes beyond care providers and physicians. And I can tell you from, from LTI's perspective, we just um, did a deal with Ritchie in West Virginia, which is the Ritchie healthcare system, but it's in all the schools. We put kiosks in there, we put portoscopes in there, we put um, EKG, pulse ox, blood pressure, temperature, and um, um, uh, something, oh, uh, oxygen, or, oxygen, so pulse ox. So we put these five in ones, these um, horoscopes, these healthcare centers in the schools. And would you mind talking a little bit about that or, or even Eric um, on, because I know Eric brought this up on some of the specific work that's being done in schools, because that's really that. They've been the most impacted, I feel like. I agree um, because of COVID. Yeah, it, this is this is an issue that that we, as I said earlier, we knew was really important. And um, in in uh, 2018 and 2019, SAMHSA and CMS worked together to develop uh, a guidance that would help the school systems be able to put together programs that could actually bill Medicaid for services. So to have services in the school, they've got to be sustainable, and they're not sustainable unless they get paid for. Um, there are pretty specific kinds of requirements for, um, for services to be paid for, and we put this all together in a guidance which, which will be available after, as a result of this webinar, and people can look at that, that guidance as it might help their schools. But there are already agreements being made with behavioral health providers, um, with federally qualified health centers. Uh, that have a psychologist, psychiatrist, other types of behavioral health providers available who can provide those services to children in schools and also to their families. So for a lot of families, um, they, don't, they may not want to walk into a mental health center with their child. I mean, there's, there's, unfortunately, there remains stigma around these issues. And so the idea of being able to provide mental health services and, and also substance use disorder services in a school setting where children are comfortable, where families are comfortable, where you have a school nurse that's available to, to help to, to facilitate that visit with the provider. I think this is the way of the future. There are some school systems that are using this now, and we're trying to make that information more widely available so that other school systems can take advantage. That's great. That's great. I, I could go on all day on this one area. I know one of the things we did is one of the challenges for school districts is budget for mental health providers. And we went in and we figured out who the main employers were for the area. And then we teed up mental health providers that took that insurance and created a portal for the school district so the parents could have be a part of the decision of who is working with their children. It could be part of that mental health. 
and let their insurance pay for it to take the burden off the school district. So there's ways to do it. Yeah, and, and I'll also just say that, that the number of healthcare providers is limited. And so often the distance, this is important for, for any system, but particularly in rural areas, you can't get the providers into the schools. And, and so if the child and family can't, couldn't, it previously couldn't get to the provider, you couldn't get the care. Now with telehealth, you can bring that service right into the school. So it's acceptable uh, and, and, and appreciated by the providers as well as the children and their families. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. McCants Katz, thank you so much for everything you do and for being a part of this call and uh, taking the time to really share this important information as healthcare continues to evolve. Um, so thank you so much with that. And with that, we have um, Elliot Weiss, who is, uh, will tell us more about the policy landscape and our goals to continue moving telehealth forward. So Elliot, thank you so much for taking the time today and uh, welcome to the call. Thank you very much, Art, and um, really appreciate you guys having me on here today. I'm really pleased to be representing the American Telemedicine Association um, and our membership who is working really hard to advance um, uh, the policy landscape for telehealth right now. As uh, Eric and, and Dr. McCants Katz described so well, there was a lot of policy change that took place during COVID-19 at both the state and federal level. And so much of what's happening now at the federal landscape is an adjustment to figure out what our new normal will be. Um, right now, um, as you know, we've heard, patients have really started to adopt telehealth. They have integrated it into the way that they get healthcare for themselves, for their families. And um, I would also note, you know, um, it, it, for schools and for their communities, um, a lot of the community health options have, have really expanded. And, um, you know, uh, Dr. McCann's Katz mentioned Medicaid is a big piece to this. We're, we're reaching underserved populations now that were not previously accessible to us because of this. And that's a huge, huge deal. So part of what the American Telemedicine Association is working to do, I work on their federal advocacy team, we also have a state advocacy team, is identify the policies that were so successful during this period of COVID-19 and keep those in place for as long as we can. And I'll just run through a few of those things that have been so useful um, and, and what we're doing to, to advance them. Uh, first, at the federal level, we're working really hard to uh, continue telehealth flexibilities that were put in place for the Medicare program. So much of those involve not only telehealth, but also um, removing re regulatory restrictions that were previously in place um, on providers like nurse practitioners, physical therapists, and so many other providers um, who were uh, reaching patients. As we know, mental health is not just from those mental health providers, but also the primary care providers. So nurse practitioners, physician assistants, um, and physicians alike are really a key part to, to advancing those uh, policies forward. We've also sought to um, uh, continue to support telehealth and high deductible health plans. Um, and ERISA plans, as some of you know, uh, telehealth was offered pre-deductible uh, and high-deductible health plans during uh, the COVID-19 public health emergency. We want to see that continue. It's been a huge um, uh, advantage for a number of patients uh, to have been able to, to have that uh, additional affordability. Um, also note, part of what we're trying to advance here, some of these policies are have seen movement in Congress and some have not. Um, the House of Representatives in um, uh, about a month ago actually uh, passed what's called HR 4040, which actually was a legislative fix to, to allow a lot of these uh, flexibilities to continue uh, through the end of 2024. And we're hopeful that the Senate will act on those as well. We're doing a, a huge number of meetings to um, uh, try to advance that. Another piece of this puzzle that we've been working with in the House and the Senate is a repeal of the telehealth, mental health in-person requirement. Um, there seems to be uh, a great deal of support for this, but I know a number of members of Congress are worried about um, whether or not that will increase uh, costs associated with mental health treatment. So we've been working to identify other areas where they might be able to save money so that we can continue to have this great 
um, access to mental health services via telehealth. Um, and again, great support in Congress. We're really hopeful that we're gonna, we're gonna move that forward as well. We're also working towards a guarantee for uh, uh, telehealth coverage in federally qualified health centers, rural health centers, the Indian Health Service, TRICARE, and of course the Veterans Health Administration has been out front on mental health services in a huge way, uh, fully integrating it into their primary care services and, and throughout their care teams. Um, there's actually a, a, a proposed rule that is um, out for comment from the uh, Veterans Health Administration right now where they're talking about integrating full care teams to be able to deliver health care across state lines, um, across the country for veterans, which is a, a huge move forward for mental health. They're really setting an example for the rest of the country to follow, and we're hopeful a lot that, that states will follow that model as well. And finally, we're working to, to ensure uh, providers are able to continue to prescribe controlled substances via telemedicine, regardless of the patient's location. So much of the, the, the mental health services that, that are being provided are um, to patients in uh, really challenging situations that otherwise would not be able to go into um, an in-person healthcare setting. And so uh, when primary care services are being delivered, we know that it's important that controlled substances, particularly as we get into medication assisted treatment for um, you know, drug abuse and, and uh, things of that nature. It's very important to have access to that. So we're working to make sure that that continues to be accessible. We've, we've had conversations in Congress and with the administration about how we might be able to do that. And we're, we're optimistic about it. Um, at the state level, um, we you know, are really looking to defend significant gains that the telehealth community achieved during the pandemic. Um, and we've also had to push back against some opponents that think that brick and mortar care is um, the only care that should be delivered. Um, we view at the American Telemedicine Association that telehealth is part of an integrated healthcare delivery system. And so we're not saying that telehealth is better. We're not saying it's worse. We're saying it's part of healthcare. And that's what we continue to um, uh, advocate for at the state level when we're talking to um, governors when we're talking to state legislators alike. Um, we're working really hard to promote uh, regulatory flexibility. So working with medical boards, nursing boards, psychology boards um, to advance interstate compacts, licensure flexibilities, and other ways in which we can remove those regulatory um, uh, hindrances uh, when providers and patients are, are seeking to connect with one another. We think those are really critical um, I, I personally um, uh, have spent time advocating for these compacts, and it's really important to remove those regulator regulatory burdens. So we're going to keep continue pushing on that. Um, one, one specific policy I'll note, um, the Uniform Law Commission has uh, just approved a new policy that will be in, in state legislatures next year that actually is seeking to allow states to enter into this uniform law and it would allow providers with existing relationships with patients to treat those patients in any of the participating states regardless of what level of provider they are the huge regulatory flexibility um, and it's been endorsed by a number of organizations so we're hopeful to see that be advanced next year and then um, we again uh, modality neutral frameworks is a huge deal for the american telemedicine association so all of this is about increasing access to care, increasing the amount of equity that we see in our healthcare, um, reaching urban patients, rural patients, patients of means, patients um, who've really struggled to have resources to access healthcare. We're trying to level that playing field and make sure that everyone has access to these services and promote them across the board. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Art. Thanks so much for having us today. Elliot, thank you so much. My gosh, you were doing amazing things. I, I remember in 2020, I had the opportunity to be a fly on the wall for a couple of the calls where they were like, what's standing in the way for you delivering care? And they were going, just pulling all these obstacles, policy obstacles out of the way. So um, again, thank you for everything you are doing and have done. It's, it's, you're making impact on so many lives. So thank you with that. Thank you. And then um, the next speaker, is one of the most amazing business leaders on the planet. 
uh, 15th most rec or no, sorry, 19th most recognized brand in the world, a uh, marketing brand, a true humanitarian, uh, conscious and, and doing things like she talks about it. She thinks about it but she makes action like Kathy Ireland recovery Sist uh, centers, the substance abuse disorder, and, and just all these different places that Kathy uh, touches and shares her just love of life and kindness for others. So Kathy Ireland, thank you so much for joining. And oh, by the way, she's one of our board members. So thank you, Kathy, for joining us today. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, oh our they, anxious nation too. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> nation, which is great. Art, thank you so much. What what a joy to be with everyone today. And oh my goodness, let's talk interactive. Uh, you you all know it. it made its debut on the Inc. 5000 landing among the top 500 fastest growing companies in America. And as Art shared, it is a, it's a privilege. Uh, to serve on boards uh, for so many nonprofits uh, from the NFL, um, Providence School, the James Madison program at Princeton University, um, serving on boards of education for over 21 years. And this is the first and only for-profit board besides our company, Kathy Ireland Worldwide, and it is an honor. So great appreciation to you, Art, and to each member of this esteemed panel, um, Elliot Weiss, Dr. Eleanor McCants katz Eric Hargan, uh, incredible information that you shared today. I continue to learn more and more. I'm so grateful. And our topic today is of critical importance, back to school, mental health, it's urgent. And we're in the midst of the greatest crisis for students, in my opinion, which young people of every generation have ever endured in American history. I, I can't think of a more difficult time to be a young person um, as we've talked about COVID-19 and the variants, the political, cultural, racial unrest, substance use disorder known as SUD, including alcohol, uh, social media bullying, in-person attacks that are causing young people to face greater anxiety than any generation at any other point in our lifetimes. And fragile mental health in our youth is a crisis of grave concern. And for our children to thrive, um, Art mentioned um, this film, a, a bold new film exploring anxiety in kids. It's aptly named Anxious Nation. And that is a challenge that is facing each of us. And fragile mental health has intense contributing factors, including yet not limited to excessive time spent in consumption of dangerous social media, where young people often experience greater stress, depression, and anxiety, which tragically is known to cause suicidal ideation and indeed the frighteningly frequent loss of life. And the onset of major mental health crisis, including major depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, often begin in adolescence. And a question we must ask is, which behaviors in our communities are triggers for the onset of these illnesses? And SUD, including street drugs, prescriptions, alcohol, sniffing and huffing of household chemicals, these are truly terrifying and easy access, easier than ever before. From online to Uber means our kids can obtain drugs via a tap on their phone while in school and drugs are ordered by students in class, delivered at school during the break. And substance use disorder is starting at a younger age each year. So we must be alert and recognizing the systemic threats to our children's mental health in these unusually stressful and scary times and the impact on mental health, it is crucial. And missing the warning signs of mental health problems 
including substance issues. Um, that is li that is literally uh, just it, it is frighteningly in too many grief filled instances. It's a life or death concern, and we we talked about telehealth and as a board member and advocate for LTI, I believe in this company. Our company is committed to accessing care for all. And, and still, how do we help anyone in trouble get the needed help? And we invite everyone to be familiar with mentalhealthfirstaid.org, which does not treat as in physical first aid, it gives us essential intervention tools until we connect with a vulnerable person with professional care and the ability to solve these problems. It's as available as the substances, which accelerates the issue. So telehealth, like the drugs, is just a phone tap away. So please help anyone in your life make the choice for life. And candid, transparent conversation in every family. It's critical. Causes for anxiety and panic are literally at every turn. And our children, they recognize our fears. And uh, the famous quote, children may not obey, but children will listen. Young people are very observant. And whether we intend to or not, we often communicate our anxiety and increasing it in their lives. And that's something we must be mindful to. I mean, with social media, media in general, there is so much fear pumped into the lives of families everywhere. So we really need to take note of that. And how is that impacting our families, our children? And in addition to LTI, we've, as Art mentioned, we've opened Kathy Ireland Recovery Centers in Laconia, New Hampshire, uh, Williamson, West Virginia, with assertive growth strategies, making help available and accessible for people and affordable. And earlier, I, I acknowledged a, a very important documentary, Anxious Nation. It's premiering at film festivals. It's directed by Academy Award, Sundance Film Festival Award, and Emmy Award winner, Vanessa Roth. It's created and produced by my friend and colleague, Laura Morton, who is the author of 21 New York Times bestsellers. And Anxious Nation, it brings the vital need for parent-child dialogue and healthier relationships into sharp focus. So we must not ostrich, just hide our heads in the sand and believe, oh, you know, not in my family, because every family is at risk. Every family, uh, every child can be impacted by this. Um, this is something that, that impacts everyone. No one is, is immune to this. Um, and every child can be attacked outside of the home and through online communication within the home as well. And so we, we love our children, and yet we know that love alone is not enough when caring for young people, love must be a verb. Action is required to protect. And so I, I shared with Laura that I would be meeting with all of you today, and I asked her what I could share about this film that she believed would be most helpful. So a quote from Laura, Laura says, we hope our film initiates and encourages honestly open conversations between parents and their kids, reminding families and friends support really matters. We're calling powerfully on systems, organizations, and everyone to invest in solid resources to take care of our young people. And LTI addresses this so powerfully and beautifully. And the genetic component of mental health issues, it requires awareness and understanding. And whatever problems we face as parents, we must address because inadvertently, whatever behaviors we're presenting are so easy for children to emulate. The recreational use of certain substances is something we must be aware of, especially in the family setting. And my intention is not 
to cause more anxiety or to be critical. Rather, it is a surprise to many to learn that a child's first interaction with drugs is often in the parent's medicine chest. And we know marijuana use as an example in the home is able to forge a connection to other drug and alcohol behaviors in our children. So together we're able to engage in healthy living and thereby encourage every member of the nuclear and American family to reach for mental and physical wellness. And we can't begin too early to celebrate the benefits of communication, alertness uh, to anxiety and activities, of fitness for our bodies, minds, and souls. It is of the utmost importance. And thank you all so much for investing in back to school, supporting our children's mental health and our schools and communities. This is so much more valuable than any backpack, online course, or, or fashion statement. This back to school can be life-saving. So thank you to this incredible panel. Art, thank you for bringing us together and for the work that you're doing. And God bless you. Absolutely. Kathy, thank you so much. And um, Kathy, I, I know there's another question out there. And we started a few minutes late, so we have a little bit of time. But I wanted to see, because you're such a powerful voice. If you believe in it, you are an absolute powerful voice. And what, what happened to make you really want to be a voice for mental health, substance abuse? If it's something you feel like sharing, if not, we have a question out there, but God. I know there's a driving force for you. Uh, Art, thank you. Um, I don't know any family who is not impacted by mental health, substance use disorder. Don't know anyone who's not impacted by it. And as uh, our panel has discussed, uh, children are particularly vulnerable for so many reasons, and uh, it's it's grown at an exponential rate. And we must be proactive to stop this. Uh, children are vulnerable, um, and our I mean, we we've discussed this. I. I love children. Um, I know you you all do, and uh, th they hold a very special place in my heart. And I just believe that we've got to do all that we can to protect them. And I believe uh, young people are under attack, and we've got to do everything in our power to protect them. And so I I just I love the the history of LTI art. I love how um, there's been such a concerted effort to get this into the schools so kids have a safe place to be connected to get the care that they truly need and um, I believe in it I believe in the results and, uh, and and you are correct art and that I don't like to do anything half measure and our team joins me in that when um uh, you, you know, our process asks a lot of questions and uh, really need those answers. And we have such respect for you for what you've built and, uh, and the hows, how LTI works and how it serves people around the world. It's amazing. So thank you. Yeah. Kathy, thank you so much for being such a powerful warrior for humanity, right? Like what an amazing voice that you have and passion and, and caring for others. It's, uh, it's, you're an extraordinary person. Everyone on this panel are extraordinary people. I think we have time for one question and it is, uh, are there restrictions on how much telehealth can be used in behavioral health services? So I'll throw that out to the panel. Whoever would like to address that question, um, jump in. Again, um, thank you. I, I can, I can uh, I'll start something uh, anyway and, and ask anyone else to go into. So there, there are restrictions. There were restrictions and pretty heavy ones uh, on use of telehealth in pre-pandemic uh, that it would be used only with particular kinds of uh, programs that were encrypted. It was used in rural areas only. So there were a lot of, and, and it wasn't paid for in the same way. So there have been more recent determinations, for example, that payment for telehealth would be paid the same 
as uh, for telehealth, mental health services would be paid the same way uh, in the as in in person visits uh, in a lot of settings. Um, you know, when starting, there has to be an in person visit uh, to start these things off the six months before they begin, and then you have to have an in person visit at least once every twelve months. So there are still uh, uh, guardrails around the the use of telehealth in mental health services, but there have been movements to sort of equalize the treatment across different sites uh, to make it more neutral across sites uh, in terms of payment. So that's that's been uh, a change. But traditionally, there were fairly substantial limits um, on telehealth, uh, a lot of which have been removed uh, with the advent of the pandemic. So as we say, silver linings uh, in an otherwise uh, a pretty terrible situation. And if anyone has anything to add to that. Lemons to lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's yeah. that's what that's what was done there. Um, and and in, in, a, in a crisis situation, uh, when we knew we had to move quickly uh, to remove these restrictions to allow people to get care because they otherwise were not getting it at all. Uh, and there was enough of bad stuff that happened because of the delay or prevention of access to medicine because of the lockdowns. Uh, there were a lot of consequences, but some of the ones that have been most apparent have been in mental health and substance use. Well, thank you so much, Eric. Thank you for that answer. Um, thank you for all that you do, again, for the passion you have for others and uh, really trying to make this world a better place for everyone and uh, inclusion when it comes to healthcare an equitable healthcare system that includes mental health, which is part of healthcare. So Eric, thank you so much for everything. Elliot, you know, thank you for the policies and the, the hard work you're doing and have done to really make sure that people have access to care. It's, you know, as a species, as a race, the human race, we all have to care about each other. And this is just one of the basic ways I feel that we can care about others. And Dr. McCants Katz, um, your amazing work and your career of work that's not anywhere close to being over. So thank you for everything you do and everything you're going to do. It's such a powerful group here of people that truly are altruistic and care about others. And Kathy, the, probably the most extraordinary person I know, and I know that's saying a lot on this panel because these are all extraordinary people, but Kathy, you fight for others. You fight for health, life, humanity with a passion and a compassion that is such a rare um, piece of a person. So Kathy, thank you for everything you've done, but it's just going to get more powerful with you as, as we continue to move through. And, and we touch lives not only in the U.S., but also in other countries and globally when we create a, an entire ecosystem for healthcare that can be shared for all. So God bless you all. Thank you all for, for doing this today. And the Hargan Group for sponsoring this, the American Telemedicine Association for sponsoring this, LTI for sponsoring this, and all of you taking your time uh, today to be with us. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Art.